The story starts with some girl talking about how much she hated a guy. We find out that he pushed her away and it hurt her deeply. However, something happened that she could not have expected at all. We find out that the guy she's talking about is named Theodore, and she never wanted him dead, even with all the harm he was doing to her. Then the guy was hurt and bleeding. It seemed like that might be the end of it. The girl did not wish the guy harm, nor did she want him to suffer when the bloody guy lay on the ground in a pool of his own blood and the girl cried over him. Tears washed away all her hatred and resentment. At that moment, grief shackled her body, but beneath that grief began to awaken the lighter feelings she had felt for him. It was love, buried deep within. She still did not for a moment leave Theodore's side. She finally realizes that the love, which turned out to be her decree, was still alive and now began to flare up again. Apparently, the possibility of losing someone dear to himself made the former feelings wake up and flare up again. According to the girl's story, we learn that her name is Lily Everett. She met Theodore Valentino two years ago. Then the girl's father said that she would marry Duke Valentino. Lily was naturally very surprised. Looking at her father, she thought that he was completely crazy. Although she realized that to expect otherwise from a man who had already lost his human form and could not be, the girl, as if resigned to the fact that she had to marry against her will, we learn that the Valentino family are dukes, who have guarded the northern borders of the Kingdom of Francis since its founding. From generation to generation, the heads of the family have made a contract with a powerful spirit. But in the last ten years, that foundation has cracked. Because of this rift that happened a few years ago, the previous Duke and Duchess disappeared, and with them the next head of the family, their son, Camille Valentino. It was because of this unfortunate coincidence that Camille's younger brother, whose name is Theodore Valentino, became the head of the family and the continuer of their traditions. Because of the cracks, the duchy needed the help of other families. But because of the forces keeping them under control, the Valentinos found themselves completely isolated from the rest of the world. And at the center of all that was happening was Lily's family, Everett, that I, in front of her father, the girl thought that perhaps even it was her family that caused the cracks that caused all the misfortunes of the Duchy of Valentino. A little sad girl realizes that now her own father is marrying her off to the victim of their own deeds. The girl's father reports that Duke Valentino has always been a difficult opponent, even despite the shakeup. But lately he seems desperate for support from the other families. Father informs her that through this marriage, Valentino will receive financial support from Everett and their family will finally be able to completely absorb them. According to the head of the Everett family, the Duke still has the strength to resist, but then he will definitely give up. The girl learns that from this day she will receive lessons for brides. Despite all her shortcomings in the opinion of her father, she can be good for at least something. Because the girl has no way out, she agrees with her father, but it is obvious that she is not happy because she clenched her hand into a fist. Her father tells her that since she has understood everything she can be free, the girl immediately turns around and leaves her father's office. When she was doing her business, her brother, Heeson Everett, came up to her and asked her if Duke Valentino had the magnificent appearance for which he was so famous, and he thought that under other circumstances, she would not even dare to look at him. Heeson says that the girl has been successfully sold. The girl continues to go about her business as if not paying attention to her brother, then he asks her if she is ignoring him, but the girl tells him that she has nothing to talk to him about. The guy is incredibly surprised by his sister's words and very much infuriated by her behavior. He took a pair of scissors in his hands as if he was going to stab the girl and asked her how dare she ignore him. The girl is very surprised at her brother's behavior, but then he adds that she is not even a purebred Everett, a look of surprise on the girl's face. Lily's brother, as if coming to his senses, throws the scissors he grabbed on the floor and asks the girl if she really thinks anything will change when she marries Duke Valentino. He thinks she'll just embarrass their family, calling her an incompetent idiot. The other people who were also in Lily's room are very surprised by this behavior of her brother. Even the maid who was nearby does not know how to act in such a situation, and Lily looks as if she was thinking about something. The maid handed the girl the scissors that her brother had thrown on the floor. Lily thanked her. She was a kind person, unlike her relatives. Looking at the maid who handed her the scissors, 
Lily realizes that she is new to the castle and notices that usually the maids are not so kind to her, but she realizes that soon this maid will be like all the others. Apparently after the girl is bored with her work, she apologizes to the mistress and asks permission to continue with the tapestry tomorrow. The mistress gives her her permission, and the girl looks a little embarrassed, as if it is her first day in the castle. After she left the room she was in before, the girl walking through the corridors sees her other brother Owen Everett. It turns out that he is destined to be the future head of the Everett family, and next to him is Lord Lennon. Then Lord Lennon gets into a dialogue with the girl and asks her what kind of lord he is. He tells her to just call him brother like Owen. The young man notices that every day Leela becomes more and more beautiful. The girl is not at all interested in communicating with this guy. She thinks he is crazy. And if she could only cut off his tongue, she would immediately do it. Apparently, the young guy does not like the main character very much. From behind the Lord's back, her brother says that he heard that her father is going to marry her to Duke Valentino. The girl says that these rumors are true and she is on her way to get bride lessons. The Lord is very surprised by this. Dear friends, and if you want to see the second part of this story, be sure to subscribe to the channel. Do not forget to click on the bell to not miss new videos. And when this video will accumulate 40000 views or 5000 likes, I will definitely do for you the second part. Owen calls Valentino a creep and mentions that he's been bothering him for a long time. The guy thinks it would be great if their wedding gave them control over Valentino's family. He reminds Lily again that she's worthless and unnecessary and mentions that he hopes that at least this time she'll be useful to their family. The girl is again not very pleased with her brother's words despite him thinking that she knows that she is only a tool in this house, a thing which someone owns and has never been otherwise. She remembers being called a dirty, unworthy girl as a child and being reminded that she had to work off everything that was invested in her. Even then, she was very much abused, even though she was just a child. Duchess Everett passed away long ago, but in addition to her two sons, the Duke needed a daughter to make deals. However, due to problems with the government and not wanting to spend on a second wife, he preferred to adopt a child rather than have an illegitimate child. Then the man adopted a child with a similar appearance, which had the same hair as his silver color. He adopted a girl who did not even know who her real father is. This girl is our protagonist. Owen's friend claps the girl on the shoulder and tells her not to worry, because even if she has difficulties with Valentino, he will marry her. At first the girl seemed a little sad, but then she grinned and thanked Lord for his words of encouragement. After meeting with the guys, the girl goes to her room where she closes the door and immediately falls to the floor and wonders when she will be able to get out of this hell. She has a question in her head whether the Duke will agree to take her as his wife. She realizes that if she marries him, she will leave this family. But the girl still wonders if she will be happy even in this case. It seems to her that everything will not be so rosy because Everettians are ready to do anything for wealth and power. And the family of Duke Valentino, on the contrary, always defended justice and morality, comma, and because of this, these two families have long been at war with each other. It is obvious that their interests did not converge. While one tried to do everything in justice, others were much more devious. We learn that during the feud between these two families spilled a lot of blood and grew a mountain of corpses, the girl realizes that Duke Theodore Valentino is unlikely to be happy about such an engagement, but the girl still has hope in her heart. The girl thinks about the fact that she has lived in this hell for 10 years. She never had the courage to end this life, so she had to endure the comma, and she still hasn't given up, just because of the tiny hope that lingers in her heart. Her hope is that one day someone will come to her and give her his saving hand, pulling her out of this hell at which time an image appears in her mind of the very duke she is supposed to marry. Already out of her room, she thinks about Theodore Valentino. It turned out that the girl has long been curious to know more about this duke. She has never seen him, because there was no ball debutantes where she could get acquainted with the duke. She wonders what this duke is really like. Without the veil of rumor, the girl wonders if Theodore is really as kind and charming as other people who know him say he is. Or it could be the other way around. Two other girls look at the main character and talk to each other. 
They gossip about the girl's clothes. One asks the other what the girl is wearing. Lily is dressed in a charming dress. The girl is a little modest, but at the same time from her head still does not get out of the duke. She thinks that he is probably not suitable for her. Although it is unclear why the girl makes such conclusions because she has not even met her future husband. One of her brothers calls her an idiot, asking what she's wearing. He asks her if she really thinks it looks good on her, but the guy doesn't skimp on the name calling and calls the girl. Finally, the girl becomes clear why today her father paid so much attention to her clothes, because in his opinion, Lily ever should use everything that she was gifted by nature. That's why her dress has such a frank cut on the chest. She even becomes a little funny from everything that is happening. Looking at her brother, she wonders what he thinks about all this. She wonders if the Duke will fall for it or not. The girl does look very charming, and her eyes seem to look straight into his soul. Her brother seems a bit annoyed by this question from his sister, and says he doesn't know about the Duke, but the girl seems to have taken the bait. He starts yelling at Lily and tells her that she's already crazy, and immediately tells her to go to her room, and the guy wonders what she's doing here. But the calm girl tells her brother that her father ordered her to go to the garden, the brother asks the protagonist, what's the point of going out with the Duke dressed like that? But Lily tells him that if he's so unhappy with her appearance, and if he doesn't want her to go out with the Duke dressed like that, then let him try to talk his father into letting the girl go out in other clothes. The guy was very angry at this response from his sister, because he does not put her in anything. And accordingly, in his opinion, she should communicate with the more respectful they respond to him in this tone. The girl... Satisfied that she had been able to kill her brother verbally, goes on, she goes out into the garden of her huge house. I think about the fact that she should have brought a shawl with her. She thinks about everything that is going on and does not understand. Does her father really believe that Duke Valentino will fall in love with her at first sight? Suddenly from the outside is more complicated, is a conversation. As someone communicates with a person is not interested in immediately whether he will go somewhere. According to the person speaking, it would be better if the other person first rested. Suddenly a girl peeks around the corner to see who's chatting, then she falls in love, and her cheeks blush. Obviously she's seen someone amazing. Suddenly, we find out that there the girl saw Theodore Valentino, the guy she is going to marry soon. The Duke tells the guy next to him that he doesn't need to rest, and he will get right down to business. He asks him to follow him, and we find out that the red-haired guy's name is Carmen. Finally, Duke Theodore Valentino and Lily meet their eyes. Their eyes met, and they seem to fall in love with each other. The newlyweds did not take their eyes off each other. The girl who also noticed that they had been watching each other for a long time wondered why he was staring at her like that. Then she got shy and assumed it was because of her clothes, which were kind of inappropriate. The young Duke immediately went to the girl, and asked her if she was cold. The young man covered the girl while she was very much surprised at this, for she had expected the opposite. Apparently her thoughts about her inappropriate appearance were not justified. Looking at the girl, he noticed that she had silver hair and amazing emerald eyes. The young man immediately realized that it was Lily Everett, but he immediately noticed that it was not the best clothes for a walk. From shame, the girl immediately blushed because she knew that the clothes did not make her look good at all. Leaving the girl dressed in her own clothes, the guy immediately tells his assistant to follow him. He, of course, obeys, but turns around to look at the beautiful girl who is still standing in shock. They are approaching the carriage on which they came to this place. Apparently, they had only to see each other and Theodore should be leaving. At this time, the girl, amazed by Theodore's beauty, is looking at his back. The action moves to the Everett family mansion, where one of her brothers congratulates Lily on her engagement to the Duke, noting that it seems her father's plan has worked perfectly. The girl sips tea listening to her brother, but he adds that perhaps Theodore Valentino will want to strangle her on her wedding night. Everything happened as the girl expected. She realized that her father hated Theodore and insisted on the marriage. It turns out that these are not the easiest times in the kingdom, the current king lacks the power to keep the aristocracy under control, and the only ones who could help with that are the Delacroix and Albinus families. But even these families can no longer get out from under the power of their father, 
so Theodore simply has no other choice but to marry the girl. Her brother emphasizes that the Duke does not want the destruction of the North because of the cracks, so he decided to apologize to Lily as soon as possible to get their financial support. Her brother is visually says that he even felt a little sorry for Theodore Valentino because he is forced to marry Lily for the sake of his province. And then we realize that Duke Theodore is really a very kind man if he is willing to do anything for his province. But he realizes that Theodore won't be submissive to his father's will for long. And he thinks that when things stabilize and things get back to normal, he'll start to build up his strength. And the first thing he'll do is get rid of his wife. The guy still continues to abuse his sister, saying that one day she will simply disappear and no mouse will care about it. While the girl listening to all this is very upset that she is just a bargaining chip in the union of families. But the girl does not even seem to pay attention to her brother. She just remembers the moment of her first meeting with her future husband. After all, it was he who showed her some mercy and asked her then if the girl is not cold, her brother asks. Maybe she will already start begging him, but the girl looks at him and doesn't even know what he's talking about. She still has a picture in her mind of her first meeting with Theodore. Her brother repeats his question about the plea and then gets up from his seat angrily looking at the girl. She wonders what he's talking about because she can't understand it. But the angry brother grabs the girl by her clothes and yells at her to stop pretending to be so innocent. He expects her to beg him not to marry Theodore. He tells her to beg him to save her if she doesn't want to die like a mutt. Suddenly the door to the room opens and there is Big Brother Owen. He tells Heeson to immediately take his hands off Lily and leave this room. He looks pretty convincing and in doing so starts to walk over to his brother and Lily. The younger brother asks the older brother what happened, comma and decided to teach the girls a lesson himself. But Owen comes up to them, says that he has a certain conversation with Lily, so the younger brother must leave the room. He listened to his older brother bewildered, and immediately asked why he must leave and what he can interfere with. Owen calmly asks his brother if he should take Heeson out by force. He mentions that the younger one should leave here while he asks nicely and not to bring the matter to conflict. Heeson again gets nervous and says that he does not want to leave this room because he also wants to hear what he came to talk to this fool. That's what he called the main character. Hazen asks again why he can't listen to their conversation. He's very curious about this conversation that he can't even just be around. It's as if some kind of magic is appearing under his older brother's feet. Owen immediately grabs his little brother's hand and asks him to leave while he is still being polite. He looks as calm as possible when he says this. Unlike his little brother, who still doesn't understand why he needs to leave the room. Hazen's place was taken by Owen. He addresses his sister more politely than his predecessor. The guy mentions that he does not expect anything special from the girl, but she must try to take Duke Theodore Valentino under his control. After all, it is such a contribution is very important for the family. Everett, the girl in turn, promises that will fulfill this task. Next with him a lot of crazy look, Owen tells the main character not to forget that even after marriage with him, she will still belong to him. The girl as if a little frightened by this, but the guy reaching out his hand to her face says that until death, and even after it, she will always be part of the Everett family. He asks the girl not to forget it. After the guy gently touches her face, the girl says that of course she will not forget it. While the guy finally praises the girl and says that she is a smart girl, his behavior is very different from that of his brother, who only humiliated the girl. After they finished their conversation, Owen says goodnight to Lily. The older brother left Lily's room, and she was left all alone. The girl thinks about the fact that in this century, marriage between aristocrats is reduced to a mere contract. She knows that the previous Duke Valentino was to enter into a political marriage with Lady Albinus. But then he fell in love with Viscount Khan's eldest daughter and married her. As a result of all their actions, instead of supporting their family, Valentino's family did not become richer after the marriage, and on top of that, they weakened their military power, because they did not receive the expected support from the family with whom the marriage was supposed to take place. While Duke Valentino's family was losing its power because he did the wrong thing, other families had arranged marriages of convenience and were able to increase their wealth and power unlike their family which was even weakened. As a result of all the Duke's reckless actions, 
His family is faced with a crisis that jeopardizes their existence thanks to all these reckless actions. The current Duke Valentino and must marry. Hasten, who is again in Lily's room, says that the girl is lucky. She again looks at her brother a little embarrassed, but he adds that if Valentino's family were not in such a sad state, the Duke would not have to marry someone like her. And it is not clear why Hazen looks angry again. The girl looks at him and says she realizes that the Duke has no other choice. That's why he agrees to take her as his wife. Her brother is even more furious, though he doesn't know why. Seeing that he is incredibly angry, the girl decides to say something to him, and standing up from her seat, she looks directly at her brother. An incredibly beautiful girl in marriage-like robes comes closer to her brother and tells him that even if she's on the verge of death, she'll never ask him for help. The girl says it all with a smile, but the guy hears it and is very surprised that the girl has the nerve to say it. When he hears the girl's words, the guy is speechless because he didn't expect that the girl would ever dare to say that to him. But she walks past him and says she hates him and his older brother, Owen. Walking even further away from her brother, she wishes they would all die. The guy looks like he's puzzled by Lily's words. The girl is walking onward, a bouquet of flowers in her hands, and in the distance there is a duke whom she is about to marry. The girl is to be conducted to the wedding by her father. He was already waiting for her there, and held out his hand to lead the girl to the duke. The first time her father tells her that she is very beautiful, and congratulates her on her engagement. The girl looks at her father and blushes a little, and thanks him for all he has done for her. But she realizes that her father is finally happy to sell her to the Duke. The girl, of course, understands everything about this marriage. It is obvious to her that it is just a contract. In the hall where she has arrived, music is playing. Marking the arrival of the bride, the girl gives her father her hand, and he begins to escort her to the Duke. She notices that the petals of the Lord are at her feet as if promising a blessing. She looks around and sees people who are supposedly happy about their engagement. She realizes that it all seems like a silly show, despite the Duke who doesn't look happy at all thinks that he is probably of the same opinion as her. The girl finally reached the Duke and he extended his hand to her. The newlyweds do not look at all happy with this marriage, and the priest is already beginning the process of marriage. He said that today the young couple enters into holy union, the newlyweds stand in front of him and look directly at the priest. The girl thinks about everything that's going on and realizes that today, Theodore Valentino and Lily Everett are married, even though they didn't even want any of this. The girl is already in her bed. She remembers that Duke Theodore told her not to return his cloak, which he then gave her in the garden. From his words, the girl is sick to wear it even to holes or whatever she wants. She looks a little upset. Sitting on the bed thinking that this is nothing new, because in her opinion for the Duke she is just a stupid daughter of the Everett's he hates, she is not upset and not at all angry about what is happening now. She realizes that it would be even better if she did not love him and kept her distance from the Duke. But the girl remembers the very moment when they met in the garden. She realizes that when she saw Theodore, her heart shuddered for a moment. The girl thinks that apparently she just imagined it, and it was nothing like that. At that moment, Duke Todor enters the room where she is sitting. He is dressed in a robe from which you can see his beautiful body. The girl is very embarrassed by what she sees. But Theodore comes to the table and pours some wine into a glass. He also looks at the girl, and after he drank some wine, he looked at the girl with a smile. Lily at this time very embarrassed looking at her husband, and suddenly he suddenly grabs the girl and starts kissing her. She could not expect such a sharp turn of events. The girl is obviously very surprised. The newlyweds continue kissing, and obviously both enjoy it. Theodore grabs the girl's hand, but after they stop kissing, the girl tells him to stop doing it. Theodore towers over the girl and asks her if he heard correctly that he should stop doing it. A little sad girl thinks about everything that has happened. She realizes that of course she did not expect that their first night would be tender but it is obvious that the girl could not expect such an outcome either. She finally decides to answer Theodore. Lily says he's free to do as he pleases, but the guy gets on top of the girl and says it's not him. It's her who wants it. He's on top and looks the girl right in the eyes. Theodore starts kissing Lily's neck. She tries to say something to him, but the girl just blushes, and it's obvious that I like it too. 
She lets out a comma moan while somehow Adora leaves a hickey on her neck. He grabs the girl's hand again while she thinks about it. Strange feeling. But still, it was pretty predictable. After Theodore finished kissing her neck, he looks at the girl who is very flushed and horny from everything. Lily, of course, also looks at Theodore and realizes that he won't be respectful to her. You can see from the guy's face that he doesn't look like he's enjoying his first wedding night very much. Lily looks at Theodore again. He towers majestically over the girl with his beautiful body and suddenly stops. The guy gets up from the girl and says that it will be enough for her father. But suddenly, he grabs the scissors that were next to the bed. And while the girl is wondering what he's going to do with them, Theodore raises his hand as if he's going to stab someone with the scissors before he does what he's going to do, saying that her father probably won't suspect a thing. Suddenly, all of a sudden, Duke Theodore made himself a useful hand and smeared his blood on the bed. It becomes clear that he did this to make her father think she had lost her virginity. The girl was very much surprised by such an act from the Duke, but he just threw the scissors on the floor and said that there is no point in doing something that no one wants to do. Obviously, he's not thrilled with the idea of marriage either, but at the moment, it is a simple necessity for the survival of his family. After he executes his plan, he tells Lily that they should make the most of each other, but he mentions that he won't sit still, and when their marriage is meaningless, everything will change. Looking at the girl, he says that after the marriage spends the meaning he will make them divorce without problems, and until that day, they will be a couple only on paper. You can see from the guy's face that he has serious intentions in terms of rebuilding his family. The girl thinks about the words that Theodore said, and suddenly she realizes that they could break up at any moment. Sitting on the bed, she realizes that apparently her grief is not only in the marriage, which she did not want at all, and that suddenly she had some feelings for Theodore. For as soon as she met his gaze, she realized that at that moment her body was pierced by an invisible arrow. Apparently it was the same feelings that had arisen. Still sitting on her bed, she realizes that the same arrow has left a painful scar that she doesn't know how to heal. The action shifts to a few days later in the Duchy of Valentino. The carriage Lily is in is rushing away. The girl looks out the window of her carriage and sees complete devastation and pools of blood people are hiding in houses just so they won't be touched. The girl sees a mother and daughter hiding in the house. They look very exhausted and wounded. Lily is surprised by everything she sees, because it's the first time she sees all this with her own eyes. She realizes that all this happened because of the Everett family. Together with the girl in the carriage rides and what you are a maid, obviously the girl is very much disturbed by all that she has just seen on the street. The maid wondered at her current mistress. What has happened? But the girl did not even have time to answer, when suddenly the door to the carriage is opened by Duke Theodore. He looks very worried at first, but then seeing that all is well, mentions that he came to find out what the noise in the carriage. Then he emphasizes that apparently the noble Lady Everett did not like the scenery outside the window. Theodore also asks the girl to hold on just a little longer because they're almost at their destination. He also tells her not to look out the window, and then the girl tries to tell him something, but Theodore slams the door without letting her speak. After all this, the girl tells the surprised maid that everything is fine, convinces her to sit down comfortably so they can continue on their way. The maid naturally obeys. Lily was very glad that Charlotte had decided to join her on the trip, for no other maid was willing to leave the Everett family home with her. Lily recalls how, as she was about to leave the parents' house, Charlotte came up to her, crying, and asked for permission to escort her out. Lily realized that she had a hard road ahead of her, which meant only one thing, that Charlotte would have to go along with her. The sad girl thought it might be better to refuse to let her maid go along with her. After the Duke had gone, the maid called Lily and told her that the Duke seemed very much worried, for she had noticed that as soon as he had heard the noise in the carriage, he had come at once to check it personally and to make sure that the girls in the carriage were well and that the journey was going well. Hearing this inference, the girl seems a little pleased. After a while, the carriage finally reaches its destination, namely the castle of the Dukes of Valentino. Once again, the Duke shows concern. When the carriage stopped after opening the door, he gives the girl's hand and offers her his help in getting down from the carriage. 
The girl does not refuse it. She gives her hand to the duke. While she was descending from the carriage, suddenly the girl stumbles and begins to fall. But immediately the duke catches her in his arms. Neither of them expected such an unexpected incident. Even after Theodore catches the flying girl, they hug for a while, as if they were going to kiss at that moment. And it would seem to be about to happen when suddenly the unexpected happens. Suddenly a voice from outside says that Theodore has finally arrived and asks him to come in quickly. Both heroes are very embarrassed, and the Snow White girl blushed as if she were a cancer. Suddenly a woman approaches their carriage. We learn that it is Mrs. Annabella Simua. We learn that this woman is the younger sister of Theodore's mother, who takes care of Theodore. We also learn that this woman is not married, although she is over 40 years old. She acts as the mistress of this family, because that's what the previous Mrs. Valentine willed. Then she asked Renee to take care of her children. Renee mercifully meets the girl and tells her, Welcome to their family. Lily thanks Mrs. Simois and says she hopes they get along well. The woman turns around and tells Theodore to hurry up and go inside with her. He obeys the woman and calls her auntie. Lily stands behind Theodore and stares at his back. The Duke looks sad. After a while, one of the Valentino family maids introduces the girl to her room. Also, the girls say that if she needs anything, she just has to pull some rope. The maid also asks if the girl needs anything else, but she says she doesn't need anything else and she's fine. And the girl gives the maid permission to leave. As Lily looks around, she realizes that from now on, it's going to be very difficult for them to live as normal spouses. But she wonders at what point her life went wrong. She thinks that everything may have gone wrong since her mother's maid spent the night with the wanderer and got her pregnant. She realizes that her mother didn't even realize that he might leave without giving his name. She thinks her mother is stupid. The girl decides that she will just pretend as if she doesn't exist. She won't plan anything, and she won't expect anything. At the same time, a picture of Duke Theodore on that very first night when he cut his hand emerges. She realizes that whatever feelings she has, she needs to smother them immediately. The action moves forward a few days. The castle is filled with some people. Apparently, there is some kind of ball going on. The girl stands majestically on her seat. She looks sad and not happy. She again thinks about the fact that she has been in this castle for several days. But the Duke does not even look in her direction, she asks herself. Is she so hateful to him? The girl thinks that this lavish banquet was organized especially for her former family to notice all this. The duke notices that the girl is very sad. He looks at her and says that he thinks that she does not like the treats that are at the banquet. He looks directly into the girl's eyes and says that he asks her to avoid familiarity in the future because he does not intend to stay married until death do them part. Looking at the girl, he says that he hopes that she understands all this but since they are in a partnership that neither party wants, there is no point in getting attached to each other. The girl thinks about the fact that she was just planning not to waste energy on unnecessary emotions and replies to the Duke that she understands everything perfectly well. The Duke once again drinking wine says that it really does seem that the girl understands everything. After the banquet was over, the girl returned to her room, where she was met by a happy Charlotte and seeing that the girl looked very tired, she asked her if everything was all right. The tired girl says that she didn't expect the banquet to be so tiring. Charlotte notices that she is very tired and informs the girl that she has almost prepared the bath, so she has to wait just a little bit longer. The girl notices that Charlotte's hands look very wounded and suddenly becomes distant. Charlotte doesn't understand why Lily is so abruptly distant from her, Suddenly, she asks Charlotte if the other services of this castle help her. Charlotte is very much surprised by such a question from her mistress. She says that she is fine and is handling everything perfectly well by herself. Also, the girl says that she doesn't want Lily to get in trouble for such nonsense. She asks her mistress not to worry about herself, because from what she says, she is very strong. Lily realizes what it means. Her maid is really not helped by the maids in this house. Charlotte tries to say that she is really fine, but Lily interrupts her and says that she understands what the maid is worried about. Lily exposes her body in order to take a bath. After getting into the bathtub, water starts to flow out of it, but she mentioned that the house is already full of people who hate her. 
The protagonist says that even if she makes a fuss about it, it won't get any worse. With Charlotte standing next to the bathtub with her mistress's robes in her hands and apologizing to her for something, Lily asks the girl why she should forgive her and tells her that Charlotte should forgive her. But Charlotte immediately says that a mistress should not ask for her forgiveness and mentions that it's because she's an orphan. Lily, a little saddened by Charlotte's story, asks her if she wants to return to Everett Castle where she was before. The maid is very much surprised by such a question from her mistress and asks a counter question. A flustered Charlotte asks why she is suddenly asking her about it, but she emphasizes that she likes to be near Lily. She realizes that if she returns to the Everett family castle, no one will be happy to see her. Charlotte mentions that she has no one at all and begins to cry very hard. Mistress is very much surprised by this, and it was when she heard her words, she realized that just as she was comforted by Charlotte's presence, Charlotte found peace in her. The girl realizes that they are like two animals licking each other's wounds. Lily says that she understands Charlotte. While Charlotte is still crying uncontrollably, the protagonist approaches the girl and hugs her, mentioning that she appreciates how much the girl cares for her. While Lily takes a bath, she gently hugs Charlotte's head. It's obvious that the girls appreciate each other a lot for being supportive of one another. The next day, Lily goes into the hall and asks the butler to call all the maids who help her personal maid with her work. The butler is very surprised by such a request from the new mistress. After the butler fulfilled the girl's request, all the maids who were supposed to help Charlotte gathered in the same place. They all look as if they realize that they are about to be in trouble. But one of them decides to ask the mistress if she wants to see them. The incredibly calm, Lily asks the girl who was the bravest if she knows her name is Lola. She asks her why she doesn't help Charlotte as she should. She also asks if the maid knows the word negligence. Lily, a little angry, says that ignoring Charlotte just because she is the girl's personal maid is low and childish, but Lola says she had a lot of work to do and couldn't help it. She also mentions that she's sorry. Lola says that it is normal for one person to work for two, because the servants in Valentino's castle are always very busy because of the duchy's difficult state. The protagonist looks at her in surprise and begins to think about the girl's words. Lily is very surprised that this maid is trying to verbally confront her current mistress. She realizes that it doesn't matter who she was or what family she came from, but now she is the Duchess of Valentino and the mistress of this castle at the same time. All the girls who were supposed to help Charlotte are standing in front of the girl and seem to be very much surprised by such a push from the new mistress. But the girl continues to wonder about the behavior of these maids, she is surprised by their behavior and wonders. Will they not show her even a basic respect? She finally understood how to answer the maid and said that if she does not cope with the duties of the mistress of the castle, she will gladly accept criticism. But this criticism should not come from the maid, but from her own husband or a senior member of the family. The girl is left without words and tries to justify herself somehow, but all her attempts are in vain. Suddenly, the oldest member of the family appears from behind the maids and asks what all the fuss is about. It turns out to be Duke Theodore's aunt. She looks very indignant and asks the manager to explain to her the situation that is going on here. The protagonist does not expect the woman to take her side, but she turns to her maids and says, El Ol, that she realizes that she and the others have been very busy with work lately. However, they must not forget their direct duties. The maid apologizes to Mrs. Simua, but the unperturbed woman asks them to do their work properly from now on. She also mentions that it concerns all of them, and not just Lola. The maid naturally has no choice but to listen to the orders of her mistress. The woman turns to the protagonist and tells her that she's told off all the maids and she shouldn't get upset. She says the girls will do her bidding without a fight and they won't be any more trouble. The protagonist looks at Mrs. Simua and notices that this woman seems to be saying that she is the mistress of this house and she has a special power here, unlike her who has no power at all. The protagonist turns to Mrs. Simoine and says that if the maids really begin to help Charlotte, there will be no problems about it in the future. The woman says that of course they will, because she has given them an order. She also emphasizes that the girl was unlucky to get married in such a difficult period. The woman noted that it must be hard for her to get used to the new environment. 
but Lily says that she will try to get used to it as soon as possible. The woman also emphasizes that they met very fortunately because she wanted to offer something to the young girl. Lily is very surprised and asks what the offer is. But the woman voices her proposal, which is that the girl inspects the province. The protagonist looks at her and it becomes clear, in her opinion, this woman just wants to humiliate her. Lily is sick of everything. She wants it to be over quickly and does not want to get used to new abuse. And the girl thinks about what will be Charlotte if she dies, while thinking that it would be easier to poison herself because she is sick of everything. From her words, she can no longer stay here, but also cannot return to the castle Everett. She is very sick of everything that is happening. Suddenly, the heroine pretends that nothing is bothering her and says with a smile on her face that she will certainly go to the inspection. But only after she is thoroughly prepared for it, Mrs. Samua is very surprised by such a cheerful reaction from the girl. Lily turns around and starts to walk away from the meeting place with the manager and mistress of the house looking at her back. It is obvious that the girl just pretended that she is doing well, although we realize that she does not really feel good here. After the girl had prepared herself, a carriage pulled up to the castle, watched by Duke Theodore himself. After a short ride, they arrived instead of the destination, and the girl began to look around. She is accompanied by two lads who are supposed to be guarding her in these parts. They lead her along and tell the girl to be careful, but she looks around and sees poor, poor, poor people. The girl notices that things are worse than she imagined. She sees what people are eating and realizes that the most pressing problem is food. People simply have nothing to eat. She tried to find the most modest outfit, but even the one she's wearing is made of silk. She realizes that such luxury is a mockery of the local people who don't even have anything to eat. Together with her subjects, the girl starts to feed people. She brings them buns. People take the food that the subjects and the girl gives them, and of course, they are thanked for feeding them. Suddenly, a stone flies directly at Lily. The man who threw it began to insult the girl and wished her to die while not forgetting to call her a witch. The man calls the girl the cursed spawn of the Everett family. But then the guards intervene and twist the man who threw the stone. He apologizes to the guard but says he doesn't care if he burns in hell, but he's going to kill the witch anyway. The detained man keeps shouting that she is from the bloody Everett family. He mentions that it's all because of her and her family. In his opinion, she and her father and her demon brothers are to blame for everything that happens. He curses the girl and says that they will pay for all their sins. The girl dropped food on the ground, which she had to give to the peasants. She realizes that absolutely everyone around hates her. And after all, she did nothing and only came to give people food. She naturally realizes that all because she is the daughter of Duke Everett, although he is not even her own father. The protagonist looks around and clearly reads in the eyes of everyone that there is no one who would be on her side. All the exhausted people look at her with contempt and a kind of hatred. The same realizes the girl. She knows that she is hated by everyone here because of the actions of her family. It's night outside. Charlotte asks her mistress if she's okay because from the look of the girl you can tell that she's obviously not feeling well enough. There are some bruises under her eyes and she looks quite upset herself. The maid carefully asks her mistress if she wants warm milk before going to bed because she noticed that the main character very often skips dinner and this fact makes the maid worried about the health of the girl. But the girl in response says that everything is fine and let her not worry, because tomorrow she will start eating well. Charlotte asks for a promise from the girl that she will eat properly, as it is a necessity for her, and the girl gives her word, upset. Charlotte leaves, while the girl pretends that she is fine. She is actually very upset, and remembers the moment when she saw people staring at her when she was making an inspection of the area. She realizes that even when she actively tries to help them, it looks insulting and hypocritical, but she can't do anything about it. The girl looks very determined and realizes that she must find a way to help these ordinary people who have been harmed by her family. Suddenly, she opens a box with her jewelry. There is a lot of different rings and brooches that are certainly worth fabulous money. She looks at them and realizes that she has to keep only a few pieces of jewelry that she brought with her, and the rest she decides to sell. She knows that her father gave them to her as a dowry, 
but he hardly cares what she does with them. The girl realizes that he only wanted to shine the wealth of his family. The girl realizes that this jewelry is very valuable and should be given a lot of money for it. She could give this money to the manager, but people already say that she is a hypocrite and does not know her place. Plus, if she sells them so soon after the wedding, it could look very humiliating to the Duke, who obviously wouldn't be too happy about such an act on the part of his new wife. The girl figures there's only one way to put that money to good use. The girl opens another jewelry box she brought with her and sees another piece of jewelry she brought with her. There's a magic pendant Owen gave her. She remembers her brother telling her to use it if she wanted to secretly spy on Valentine's family because this magic pendant will change her appearance to anything she can imagine. The girl picks up the pendant and thinks that she never thought she could use this crazy guy's tricks. But at least we know that she's going to use this magical necklace for good purposes. She realizes that this way she can turn into a maid or a guard to deliver food to people. According to the girl's plan, she will buy food with the proceeds from the sale of her jewelry and help poor people. The girl thinks that this is a good plan. The action moves forward in time, and we realize that the girl's plan only seemed good, but it wasn't. At the table, Duke Theodore tells the girl that he has heard that she has sold all her jewelry. The girl tries to drink tea nonchalantly, but she is absorbed in her thoughts. She thinks about the fact that she paid that damn merchant to keep quiet, but he couldn't keep his word and blabbed everything. In the reflection of the mug she holds in her hands, we can see the surprised face of the girl. Her hands are shaking a little from fear. The girl tells her husband that she is going to buy new jewelry to replace the old ones, but she realizes that this is just a lie. The Duke says that the girl did not have to sell her jewelry to afford new ones, because although they have a difficult financial situation, the Duchy of Valentino still owns the North. Theodore says that the money allocated to her should be more than enough to buy new jewelry. According to him, she will have the money and save face. The girl thinks that if it was just about money, she would not have done something like this. But she decides to just apologize to her husband and promise him that she will be much more careful from now on. But the girl looks at her husband and notices that there is something wrong with him. Looking more closely at Duke Theodore, she realizes that he is very pale today. The girl heard that he did not get along well with the very spirit with whom the contract was made. She wonders if this is still a problem for them. Theodore gets up from the table and says that's all he wanted to say to her and he has to go. The girl is very surprised at her husband's abrupt departure, and as he leaves, she looks after him. Theodore says that she decided to sell her jewelry to recover from the shock of the state of their province, which he says is as typical of the Everett family as possible. The girl looks at his back in surprise and realizes that he has guessed all her plans, but Hertz says that of course he will not show her anything so unpleasant again, and slams the door loudly before leaving. The girl is sad again, because even her good deed was not appreciated. She thinks about the fact that the Duke did not even ask her if she was not afraid to eat, because the locals almost strangled her in a rage. She thinks that maybe you and a fool. It would be better if the local would kill her. She realizes that in this case he could get rid of the nuisance and would not get his hands dirty. Deep in the night, the main character lies on the bed, but she cannot sleep, because she does not sleep at all. The girl gets out of bed and decides that she should go for a walk, but to do it very quietly, because she does not want to wake Charlotte, who is so sweetly sleeping. After the girl goes outside and starts walking through the garden, she notices the Duke standing by a tree. She is very surprised to find Theodore in the garden in the middle of the night and wonders what he is doing here so late. The guy just sits and looks into the tree. The girl looks more closely and notices that the guy is talking to the tree, as if addressing his brother. Theodore says that if his brother were here, everything would be completely different. The girl is very surprised to hear the word brother. Suddenly the girl tries to hide a little so that Theodore won't notice that she is in the garden. But the guy heard a noise and turned around to see what's there. The girl is a little scared that the Duke might notice her here. The Duke turns around in tears and asks Lily what she's doing here. Obviously, he's crying because he's had a flashback with his brother. The girl tries to justify her presence in the garden, but the Duke doesn't even let her speak. The Duke starts to approach the girl, 
and more insistently asks what she is doing here. The girl is a little frightened by this pressure from the Duke and answers him that she was just walking in the garden. The Duke does not believe that the girl was just walking at this late hour. He believes that she came here on purpose because she wanted to see him weeping. The girl says that she was not peeping at all, although she will probably not be able to justify herself. The boy grabs the girl's hand and pulls her close. Duke Theodore says that poking around the castle is not a wise move. The boy mentions that she won't find anything here worth her attention. But the girl again justifies herself and says that she wasn't looking for anything. The Duke, after he's done crying, says he can't believe she just decided to take a walk in the middle of the night. And besides, she's here alone without her maid. The smiling guy says he finds that very hard to believe. Lily says he's free to think as he pleases. But the guy just turns around and takes the girl's hand and says they have to go somewhere. After they've reached the castle and entered it, the girl asks the Duke to stop a bit. After the Duke turned around to see why the girl told him to stop a little, he sees her who is very tired. The girl herself realizes that it is all because the Duke is very fast pacing and she just cannot keep up with him. The guy tells the girl to go inside and not to walk around the castle alone at night anymore. Lily looking at him can't believe he's worried about her. The girl thinks about everything that is happening. She realizes that as strange as it may sound, but she just wanted to talk to Theodore a little more. She goes to her room and says goodnight to the Duke. It's already becoming day outside. Lily is lying on her bed. She didn't sleep at all this night. The girl looks a little exhausted, but it's all because she saw Duke Valentino Kama in such a condition. Charlotte comes to the bed where Lily is lying and after wishing her good morning, asks her what she wants first, breakfast or washing up. The girl says that she will start with washing up and have breakfast a little later with fruit. At the same minute, Charlotte serves her fruit. But after the girl supposedly finished, Charlotte noticed that she again did not finish. Charlotte asks her mistress to promise her that for the second breakfast she will eat more. Happy Lily says that of course it will be so. Lily asks Charlotte to tell the merchant to come in the afternoon, because her words she needs to buy something. Charlotte naturally obeys the order of her mistress. The protagonist thinks about her act, because she lied that she is going to buy jewelry, and now she needs to behave accordingly. Behind the back of the girl is one maid. It seems that her name is Jenna. But the girl is happy only one thing that in comparison with the others, she almost does not pay attention to her. So the girl thinks that it will be easier with her. Although it seems to her that apparently the maid Tasty dislikes her. The girl realizes that to be honest with herself, almost everyone in the castle doesn't like her. Finally, the merchant comes to her and she looks at the jewelry he brought her. The girl says that from what she sees, there's a problem with taste. Looking at the merchant, who is a little excited about this meeting, because last time he told Theodore everything, the girl thinks about what she paid him for his silence last time, and he went and told Duke Theodore everything, although she probably thought he was not even going to keep it a secret, because any reasonable person would have taken her for Everett's puppet. But the girl realizes that she can get back at the merchant in many ways. She reminds the merchant that he said that the next piece of jewelry would be the last. The girl asks to see the jewelry. The merchant, of course, obeys the girl and opens the box with the last piece of jewelry for her. After he opened the jewelry box, we see a beautiful green necklace. The girl looks at the jewelry and realizes that it is a green apple-colored necklace. She thinks that it would be perfect for her. But she decides to tell the merchant that she doesn't like the jewelry either. The merchant, who is a little worried that the girls didn't like his jewelry, thinks that he knew she wouldn't like it. Suddenly Theodore bursts into the room and says that if the girl doesn't like the pendant, then he will buy it. The merchant and the girl are very surprised to see the Duke here. At this time, the Duke is just watching them. The merchant sees the Duke blush and tells him he is honored to meet such a man while the girl just looks at the merchant as if he saw God in front of him. The merchant starts to leave, and the duke tells him that he should leave the pendant here, and the chief steward will pay the merchant for it. The merchant says that of course he will fulfill the duke's request, and thanks him for the purchase. The duke asks Lily if she doesn't like the jewelry, because she told the merchant, but he doesn't seem to care, and the duke insists that the girl wear it. He tells the girl that it is his humble gift to her. Theodore says he can't be accused of not spoiling the noble daughter of the Everett family. The girl thinks his words are logical, 
because he thinks she is the Duke's daughter. She wonders what Theodore will say when he finds out she is not his own and has not a drop of Everett blood in her. And she's not of noble birth either. I wonder if the Duke will hate her more or if things will change radically. The Duke asks the girl to remove her hair for a second so he can put the pendant around her neck. After he puts the pendant on the girl, we see that it matches her green eyes very nicely. Lily thanks Duke Theodore, but he just turns around and walks away. Obviously, he made the gesture just so people wouldn't say he's mistreating the daughter of the Everett family. The action moves forward sometime. The girl comes to Mrs. Simua and says that she has been informed that she wants to see her. The lady says that it is true and she has something important to tell the girl. Mrs. Simua informs the protagonist that the day after tomorrow will be the anniversary of the death of Camille, Theodore's brother. The girl is very much surprised by the words of the mistress, but finally understands why Theodore was in the garden and crying at that tree. Suddenly, the lady asks if the girl knows how his brother Camille died. The protagonist tells the woman that, as far as she knows, he died closing the crack. The woman begins to tell how everything happened in reality. According to her, the guy was only 20 and Theo was even younger. Her sister and her sister's husband were killed by a sudden fissure, and then the same fissure took Camille's life. Touching the portrait of her sister and her husband, she says that she had a deep respect for her and her husband. The woman says that everyone loved them very much, and she can't believe that they died so young. She still can't understand much. And the things the woman can't understand include the circumstances of Camille's death. While she looks at the girl, and then the protagonist realizes that she must suspect that the Everett family had something to do with the deaths. The girl realizes that if this is true, it would mean only one thing, that Everett has long been able to take control of the cracks. Although the girl has never heard that such a thing is possible, she is sure that her father could find a way to do it. The woman says that Camille was a very nice boy, very kind and considerate. He was loved by everyone, and he adored his little brother. And when Camille died, Theodore was overcome with grief. The woman says that the day after tomorrow, they will organize a memorial ceremony for the Camille. The woman says that the usual mistress of the castle should distribute the budget, make the schedule, and invite the guests. But since the girl tout is not long for this time, she will be in charge of it. The woman says that such an important event must be flawless. After she has finished speaking, the woman asks the protagonist if she understands her. The girl, with her head slightly lowered, says that of course she understands everything. The protagonist goes to her room and takes off the necklace Theodore put on her. She looks at it and thinks about the fact that that night she wanted with all her heart to comfort him, even though it didn't concern her. The protagonist remembers the words of Mrs. Simwa that you still lose peace with the approach of each new anniversary. Of course, the girl understands that this was a kind of warning because the woman meant that she should leave Theodore alone, even if she sees how hard it is for him. It was like a kind of hint that it is not her business to comfort him. The girl realizes that she has to remember her place, but it's hard for her to pretend that everything is fine when you're suffering so much and she sees it all. Besides, she's worried about another issue. Why is it that when Owen, Heeson, or Lennon felt bad she didn't care about it? The same can be said for Miss Simua and anyone else. Although even in this list there is one exception, and that person is Charlotte. The girl realizes that Charlotte holds a special place in her heart. But why does she have the same warm feelings for Theodore Valentino? The girl makes you stop thinking about it all. She grabs the necklace and thinks about divorcing him. If she doesn't get poisoned before that happens, she realizes she shouldn't feel anything at all. But still the girl looks broken. She decides to forbid her feelings, to forbid them so tightly that they won't come out. Then she won't want to comfort Theodore anymore. She realizes that she needs to imagine a little box inside her and hide everything I'm already scared to think about in this box because they're not really her feelings. Or at least they can't be her feelings she realizes that if she names them and lets them talk, she'll only get worse. The action moves forward a few days. There is already a ceremony dedicated to Camille. People are very sorry that Camille died. They are communicating among themselves that fate is very cruel, and good people like Camille and Theodore should live happily, but instead only mean Everett's live well. 
Suddenly someone says to the person who said all these words to be quiet because the girl can hear their conversation. Theodore comes up to Lily and asks her why she is standing here instead of hiding from the rain. He has an umbrella in his hands, which he hands to her so that she doesn't get wet in the downpour. After the ceremony, they went to the castle and there was an unexpected meeting. Some girl seeing Theo looks very embarrassed and says that they haven't seen each other for a long time. She looks very happy to see him. Dear friends, and if you want to see the continuation of this interesting story, be sure to subscribe to the channel to not miss new videos. And when under this video will gain 40000 views or 5000 likes, I will start doing the second part, especially for you.